Moral and Social Issues Articles by H. P. Blavatsky The Origin of Evil The Fall of Ideal Civilization, The Death of Art and Beauty H. P. Blavatsky Series No. 16 Theosophy Company, Mysore, Private Ltd. Bangalore 560004 Objects of the Theosophical Movement I to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity, without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color, to the study of ancient and modern religions, philosophies, and sciences, and the demonstration of the importance of such study, and three the investigation of the unexplained laws of nature and the psychical powers latent in man. R2SRJ2RXMMMRIMM asterisk. M. The Articles of H. P. Rolavatsky and W. Q. Judge which originally appeared in The Theosophist, Lucifer, and The Path, were issued in pamphlet form by The Theosophy Company, Los Angeles, USA. For the benefit of students and inquirers in India, these are now being reprinted in an Indian edition, Ilial Reprint Edition, 1983 III if IHOJT if NSRF by courtesy, the Theosophy Company, 245, West 33rd St, Los Angeles, California, 90007 USA Primed by VNIR at Commercial Printing House, 41-1, 3rd Main Road, Gandhinagar, Bangalore 560009 and published by J.M. Tijoravala for Theosophy Company, Mysore, Private Limited, 4, Sir Krishna Rao Road, Basavangudi, Bangalore 560004. Forward the first 50 years of the 20th century are ample justification for presenting the theosophical teaching regarding the origin of evil without either apology or prolonged introduction. The liberal, progressive atmosphere of the thought of this period, including its political ethics, its contempt for metaphysics, and its naive neglect of what is sometimes called the demonic aspect of human behavior, has since given way to the uncertainties and anxieties of the present, with too often the harsh mood of reaction replacing hopes that were suddenly overwhelmed by the appalling crimes and inhumanities of ideology on the march. The weaknesses of the present, increasingly, may be seen to be philosophical weaknesses. They are the moral harvest of a civilization which has ignored or skirted basic philosophical questions for generations, and which has allowed expedient socio-political formulas all the isms of the age to monopolize the attention of men of goodwill. During the last quarter of the last century, H. P. Blavatsky, in her magazine, Lucifer, put of record certain classical discussions of ethics and morals not excluding their bearing on aesthetics which may now be recognized as having profound and crucial relevance to the problems and dilemmas of Western civilization. These articles are metaphysical, moral, and social in content. They move from first principles of cosmological and philosophical assumption, and often, in discussions which are also tracks for the times, turn rapidly to matters of immediate socio-moral importance, since H.P.B. wrote, not as an abstracted and distant observer, but one ardently concerned with the sufferings and needs of human beings. In these pages, then, we present three articles by H.P. Blavatsky. The Origin of Evil first appeared in Lucifer for October, 1887. The writer offers metaphysical considerations which show that the world of thought will inevitably oscillate between shallow optimism and despairing, if equally shallow, pessimism, until the philosophic explanation of the mystery of evil is understood and made to illuminate the dilemmas and tragedies of human life. The second article, The Fall of Ideals, was printed in Lucifer for December, 1889, on the eve of the 15th year of existence of the Theosophical Society. It is an uncompromising judgment of the civilization of Christendom during the closing years of the 19th century. Toward the conclusion of this discussion, here somewhat abridged from the original, H.P.B. turns the symbolism of Satan, the theological explanation of evil, and relates the meaning hidden behind this tragic figure of the fallen H.P. to the metaphysical analysis given in The Origin of Evil. There follow some extraordinary statements on the connection of sacerdotal religion with the agony of the struggle for social justice and with 
the nihilism of embittered and desperate revolutionists. Civilization, the death of art and beauty, from Lucifer for May, 1891, Madame Blavatsky died in that month, is a vigorous antidote to the conceit and pride of those who assume that Western civilization represents new heights of achievement in culture and the arts. While h.p.b's caustic comments are directed at the arrogance of the 19th century, the interested and perceptive reader will have no difficulty in finding comparable enormities in the present, to justify her strongest criticisms. H.P.B. was a lover of the ancients and of the future the future of a better world she sought to help to create. For the present of then and now she could have little affection this article gives an unaccustomed light on evils modern man has become so used to that he adjusts to them. As inevitable. Lucifer, October, 1887 The origin of evil he problem of the origin of evil can be philosophically approached only if the archaic Indian formula is taken as the basis of the argument. Ancient wisdom alone solves the presence of the universal fiend in a satisfactory way. It attributes the birth of cosmos and the evolution of life to the breaking asunder of primordial, manifested unity, into plurality, or the great illusion of form. Homogeneity having transformed itself into heterogeneity, contrasts have naturally been created, hence sprang what we call evil, which thenceforward reigned supreme in this veil of tears. Materialistic Western philosophy, so misnamed, has not failed to profit by this grand metaphysical tenet. Even physical science, with chemistry at its shed, has turned its satinchen of late at the first proposition, and directs its efforts toward proving on irrefutable data the homogeneity of primordial matter. But now steps in materialistic pessimism, a teaching which is neither philosophy nor science, but only a deluge of meaningless words. Pessimism, in its latest development, having ceased to be pantheistic, having wedded itself to materialism, prepares to make capital out of the old Indian formula. But the atheistic pessimist soars no higher than the terrestrial homogeneous plasm of the Darwinists. For him the ultima thule is earth and matter, and he sees, beyond the prima materia, only an ugly void, an empty nothingness. Some of the pessimists attempt to poetize their idea after the manner of the whitened sepulchres, or the Mexican corpses, whose ghastly cheeks and lips are thickly covered with rouge. The decay of matter pierces through the mask of seeming life, all efforts to the contrary in it withstanding. Materialism patronizes Indian metaphors and imagery now. In a new work upon the subject by Drive. Mainlander, Pessimism and Progress, one learns that Indian pantheism and German pessimism are identical, and that it is the breaking up of homogeneous matter into heterogeneous material, the transition from uniformity to multiformity, which resulted in so unhappy a universe. Seth pessimism, this transition is precisely the original mistake, the primordial sin, which the whole creation has now to expiate by heavy suffering, it is just that sin, which, having launched into existence all that lives, plunged it thereby into the abysmal depths of evil and misery, to escape from which there is but one means possible, i.e., by putting an end to being itself this interpretation of the Eastern formula, attributing to it the first idea of escaping the misery of life by putting an end to being whether that being is viewed as applicable to the whole cosmos, or only to individual life is a gross misconception. The Eastern pantheist, whose philosophy teaches him to discriminate between being or esse and conditioned existence, would hardly indulge in so absurd an idea as the postulation of such an alternative. He knows he can put an end to form alone, not to being and that only on this plane of terrestrial illusion. True, he knows that by killing out in himself Tanha, the unsatisfied desire for existence, or the will to live, he will thus gradually escape the curse of rebirth and con. Dishoned existence. But he knows also that he cannot kill, or put an end, even to his own little life he except as a personality, which after all is but a change of dress. And believing but in one reality, which is eternal beingness, the causeless cause from which he has exiled himself into a world of forms, he regards the temporary and progressing manifestations of it in the state of maya, change or illusion, as the greatest evil, 
truly, but at the same time as a process in nature. As unavoidable as are the pangs of birth. It is the only means by which he can pass from limited and conditioned lives of sorrow into eternal life, or into that absolute beness, which is sagraphically expressed in the Sanskrit word sad. The pessimism of the Hindu or Buddhist pantheist is metaphysical, abstruse, and philosophical. The idea that matter and its protean manifestations are the source and origin of universal evil and sorrow is a very old one, though Gautama Buddha was the first to give it its definite expression. But the great Indian reformer assuredly never meant to make of it a handle for the modern pessimist to get hold of, or a peg for the materialist to hang his distorted and pernicious tenets upon. The sage and philosopher, who sacrificed himself for humanity by living for it, in order to save it, by teaching men to see in the sensuous existence of matter misery alone, had never in his deep philosophical mind any idea of offering a premium for suicide, his efforts were to release mankind from too strong an attachment to life, which is the chief cause of selfishness hence the creator of mutual pain and suffering. In his personal case, Buddha left us an example of fortitude to follow, in living, not in running away from life. His doctrine shows evil imminent, not in matter, which is eternal, but in the illusions created by it, through the changes and transformations of matter generating life because these changes are conditioned and such life is ephemeral. At the same time those evils are shown to be not only unavoidable, but necessary. For if we would discern good from evil, light from darkness, and appreciate the former, we can do so only through the contrasts between the two. While Buddha's philosophy points, in its dead letter meaning, only to the dark side of things on this elusive plane, its esotericism. The hidden soul of it draws the veil aside and reveals to the Arhatal the glories of life eternal in all the homogeneousness of consciousness and being. Another absurdity, no doubt, in the eyes of materialistic science and even modern idealism, yet a fact to the sage and esoteric pantheist. Nevertheless, the root idea that evil is born and generated by the ever increasing complications of the homogeneous material, which enters into form and differentiates more and more as that form be. Comes physically more perfect, Hassan esoteric side to it which seems to have never occurred to the modern pessimist. Its dead letter aspect, however, became the subject of speculation with every ancient thinking nation. Even in India the primitive thought, underlying the formula already cited, has been disfigured by sectarianism, and has led to the ritualistic, purely dogmatic observances of the Hatha Yogis, in contradistinction to the philosophical Vedantic Raja Yoga. Pagan and Christian exoteric speculation, and even medieval monastic asceticism, have extracted all they could from the originally noble idea, and made it subservient to their narrow-minded sectarian views. Their false conceptions of matter have led the Christians from the earliest day to identify woman with evil and matter notwithstanding the worship paid by the Roman Catholic Church to the Virgin. But the latest application of the misunderstood Indian formula the pessimists in Germany is quite original, and rather unexpected, as we shall see. To draw any analogy between a highly metaphysical teaching, and draw an S theory of physical evolution would in itself, seem rather a hopeless task. The more so as the theory of natural selection does not preach any conceivable extermination of being, but, on the contrary, a continuous and ever-increasing development of life. Nevertheless, German ingenuity has contrived, by means of scientific paradoxes and much sophistry, to give it a semblance of philosophical truth. The old Indian tenet itself has not escaped litigation at the hands of modern pessimism. The happy discoverer of the theory, that the origin of evil dates from the protoplasmic amoeba, which divided itself for procreation, and thus lost its immaculate homogeneity, has laid claim to the Aryan archaic formula in his new volume. While extolling its philosophy and the depth of ancient conceptions, he declares that it ought to be viewed as the most profound truth precogitated and robbed by the ancient sages from modern thought. It thus follows that the deeply religious pantheism of the Hindu and Buddhist philosopher, and the occasional vagaries of the Pesi mystic materialist, are placed on the same level and identified by modern thought. 
the impassable chasm between the two is ignored. It matters little, it seems, that the pantheist, recognizing no reality in the manifested cosmos, and regarding it as a simple illusion of his senses, has to view his own existence also as only a bundle of illusions. When, therefore, he speaks of the means of escaping from the sufferings of objective life, his view of those sufferings, and his motive for putting an end to existence are entirely different from those of the pessimistic materialist. For him, pain as well as sorrow are illusions, due to attachment to this life, and ignorance. Therefore he strives after eternal, changeless life, and absolute consciousness in Thestatov Nirvana, whereas the European pessimist, taking the evils of life as realities, aspires when he has the time to aspire after anything except those said mundane realities. To annihilation of being, as he expresses it. For the philosopher there is but one real life, nirvanic bliss, which I is a state differing in kind, not in degree only, from that of any of the planes of consciousness in the manifested universe. The pessimist calls nirvana superstition, and explains it as cessation of life, life for him beginning and ending on earth. The former ignores in his spiritual aspirations even Dein de Graal Homogenea Genet, of which the German pessimist now makes such capital. He knows of, and believes in only the direct cause of that unit, eternal and ever-living, because the one uncreated, or rather not evolute. Hence all his efforts are directed toward the speediest reunion possible with, and return to his pre-primordial condition, after his pilgrimage through this elusive series of visionary lives, with their unreal phantasma. Gloria of sensuous perceptions. Such pantheism can be qualified as pessimistic only by a believer in a personal providence, by one who contrasts its negation of the reality of anything created i.e., conditioned and limited with his own blind unphilosophical faith. The oriental mind does not busy itself with extracting evil from every radical law and manifestation of life, and multiplying every phenomenal quantity by the units of very often imaginary evils, the eastern pantheist simply submits to the inevitable, and tries to blot out from his path in life as many descents into rebirth as he can, by avoiding the creation of new karmic causes. The Buddhist philosopher knows that the duration of the series of lives of every human being unless he reaches nirvana artificially, takes the kingdom of God by violence, in Kabbalistic parlance, is given, allegorically, in the fourteen days passed by Gautama the Buddha under the bow tree. And the Hindu sage is aware, in his turn, that he has to light the first, and extinguish the forty-ninth fire one before he reaches his final deliverance. Knowing this, both sage and philosopher wait patiently for the natural hour of deliverance, whereas their unlucky copyist, the European pessimist, is ever ready to commit, as to preach, suicide. Ignorant of the numberless heads of the hydra of existence, he is incapable of feeling the same philosophical scorn for life as he does for death, and of, thereby, following the wise example given him by his oriental brother. Thus, Philosophic pantheism is very different from modern pessimism. The first is based upon the correct understanding of the mysteries of being, the latter is in reality only one more system of evil added by unhealthy fancy to the already large sum of real social evils. In sober truth it is no philosophy, but simply a systematic slander of life and being, the bilious utterances of a dyspeptic or an incurable hypochondriac. No parallel can ever be attempted between the two systems of thought. The seeds of evil and sorrow were indeed the earliest result and consequence of the heterogeneity of the manifested universe. Still they are but an illusion produced by the law of contrasts, which, as described, is a fundamental law in nature. Neither good nor evil would exist were it not for the light they mutually throw on each eye this is an esoteric tenet, and the general reader will not make much out of it. But the theosophist who has read esoteric Buddhism may compute the seven by seven of the forty-nine days and the forty-nine fires, and understand that the allegory refers esoterically to the seven human consecutive root races with their seven subdivisions every monad is born in the first and obtains deliverance in the last seventh race. Only a Buddha is shown reaching it during the course of one life. Other Being, under whatever form, 
having been observed from the world's creation to offer these contrasts, an evil predominating in the universe owing to pound goship or selfishness, the rich oriental metaphor has pointed to existence as expiating the mistake of nature, and the human soul, Siak, was henceforth regarded as the scapegoat and victim of unconscious oversoul. But it is not to pessimism, but to wisdom that it gave birth. Ignorance alone is the willing martyr but knowledge is the master, of natural pessimism. Gradually, and by the process of heredity or atavism, the latter became innate in man. It is always present in us, howsoever latent and silent its voice in the beginning. Amid the early joys of existence, when we are still full of the vital energies of youth, we are yet apt, each of us, at the first pang of sorrow, after a failure, or at the sudden appearance of a black cloud, to accuse life of it, to feel life a burden, and often curse our being. This shows pessimism in our blood, but at the same time the presence of the fruits of ignorance. As mankind multiplies and with its suffering which is the natural result of an increasing number of units that generated sorrow and pain are intensified. We live in an atmosphere of gloom and despair, but this is because our eyes are downcast and riveted to the earth, with all its physical and grossly material manifestations. If, instead of that, man proceeding on his life journey looked not heavenward, which is but a figure of speech but within himself and centered his point of observation on the inner man, he would soon escape from the coils of the great serpent of illusion. From the cradle to the grave, his life would then become supportable and worth living, even in its worst phases. Pessimism that chronic suspicion of lurking evil everywhere is thus of a twofold nature, and brings fruits of two kinds. It is a natural characteristic in physical man, and becomes a curse only to the ignorant. It is a boon to the spiritual, inasmuch as it makes the latter turn into the right path, and brings him to the discovery of another as fundamental a truth, namely, that all in this world is only preparatory because transitory. It is like a chink in the dark prison wall soft earth life, through which breaks in a ray of light from the eternal home, which, illuminating the inner senses, whispers to the prisoner in his shell of clay of the origin and the dual mystery of our being. At the same time, it is a tacit proof of the presence in man of that which knows, without being told, viz., that there is another and a better life, once that the curse of earth lives is lived through. This explanation of the problem and origin of evil being, as already said, of an entirely metaphysical character, has nothing to do with physical laws. Belonging as it does altogether to the spiritual part of man, to dabble with it superficially is, therefore, far more dangerous than to remain ignorant of it. For, as it lies at the very root of Gautama Buddha's ethics, and since it has now fallen into the hands of the modern Philistines of materialism, to confuse the two systems of pessimistic thought can lead but a mental suicide, if it does not lead to worse. Eastern wisdom teaches that spirit has to pass through the ordeal of incarnation and life, and be baptized with matter before it can reach experience and knowledge. After which only it receives the baptism of soul or self-consciousness and may return to its original condition of a god, plus experience, ending with omniscience. In other words, it can return to the original state of the homogeneity of primordial essence only through the addition of the fruitage of karma, which alone is able to create an absolute conscious deity, removed but one degree from the absolute all. Even according to the letter of the Bible, evil must have existed before Adam and Eve, who, therefore, are innocent of the slander of the original sin. For, had there been no evil or sin before them, there could exist neither tempting serpent nor a tree of knowledge of good and evil in Eden. The characteristics of that apple tree are shown in the verse when the couple had tasted of its fruit, the eyes of them both were opened, and they and you many things besides knowing they were naked. Too much knowledge about things of matter is thus rightly shown an evil. But so it is, and it is our duty to examine and combat the new pernicious theory. Hitherto, pessimism was kept in the regions of philosophy and metaphysics, and showed no pretensions to intrude into the domain of purely physical science, such as Darwinism. The theory of evolution has become almost universal now, and there is no school, 
save the Sunday and missionary schools, where it is not taught, with more or less modifications from the original program. On the other hand, there is no other teaching more abused and taken advantage of than evolution, especially by the application of its fundamental laws to the solution of the most compound and abstract problems of man's many-sided existence. There, where psychology and even philosophy fear to tread materialistic biology applies its sledgehammer of superficial analogies and prejudiced conclusions. Worse than all, claiming man to be only a higher animal, it maintains this right as undeniably pertaining to the domain of the science of evolution. Paradoxes in those domains do not reign now, they pour. As man is the measure of all things, therefore is man measured and analyzed by the animal. One German materialist claims spiritual and psychic evolution as the lawful property of physiology and biology, the mysteries of embryology and zoology alone, it is said, being capable of solving those of consciousness in man and the origin of his soul. To another finds justification for suicide in the example of animals, who, when tired of living, put an end to existence by starvation registered trademark hitherto pessimism, notwithstanding the abundance and brilliancy of its paradoxes, had a weak point namely, the absence of any real and evident basis for it to rest upon. Its followers had no living, guiding thought to serve them as a beacon and help them to steer clear of the sandbanks of life real and imaginary so profusely sown by themselves in the shape of denunciations against life and being. All they could do was to rely upon their representatives, who occupied their time very ingeniously if not profitably, in tacking the many and various evils of life to the metaphysical propositions of great German thinkers, like Schopenhauer and Hartmann, as small boys tack on colored tails to the kites of their elders and rejoice at seeing them launched in the air. But now the program will be changed. The pessimists have found something more solid and authoritative, if less philosophical, to tack their jeremiads and dirges to, than the metaphysical kites of Schopenhauer. The day when they agreed with the views of this philosopher, which pointed at the universal will as the perpetrator of all the world evil, is gone to return no more. Nor will they be any better satisfied with the hazy unconscious of von Hartmann. They have been seeking diligently for a more congenial and less metaphysical soil to build their pessimistic philosophy upon, and they have been rewarded with success, now that the cause of universal suffering has been discovered by them in the fundamental laws of physical development. Evil will no longer be allied with the misty and uncertain phantom called will, but with an actual and obvious fact, the pessimists will henceforth be towed by the evolutionists. Do heckel. 3. Leo Bach. The basic argument of their representative has been given in the opening sentence of this article. The universe and all on it appeared in consequence of the breaking asunder of unity into plurality. This rather dim rendering of Helmdian formula is not made a torfer, as I have shown, in the mind of the pessimist, to the one unity, to the Vedantin abstraction para Brahm, otherwise, I should certainly not have used the words breaking up. Nor does it concern itself much with Malaprakriti dot or the veil of para Brahm, nor even with the first manifested primordial matter, except inferentially. As follows from Drive. Mainlander's exposition, but chiefly with the terrestrial protoplasm. Spirit or deity is entirely ignored in this case, evidently because of the necessity for showing the whole as the lawful domain of physical science. In short, the time-honored formula is claimed to have its basis and to find its justification in the theory that from a few, perhaps, one, single form of the very simplest nature, Darwin, all the different animals and plants living today, and all the organisms that have ever lived on the earth, have gradually developed. It is this axiom of science, we are told, which justifies and demonstrates the Hindu philosophical tenet. What is this axiom? Why, it is this, science teaches that this series of transformations through which the seed is made to pass the seed that grows into a tree dot or becomes an ovum, or that which develops into an animal consists in every case in nothing but the passage of the fabric of that seed, from the homogeneous into the heterogeneous or compound form. This is then the scientific verity which checks the Indian formula by that of the evolutionists, 
identifies both, and thus exalts ancient wisdom by recognizing it worthy of modern materialistic thought. This philosophical formula is not simply corroborated by the individual growth and development of isolated species, explains our pessimist, but it is demonstrated in general as in detail. It is shown justified in the evolution and growth of the universe as well as in that of our planet. In short, the birth, growth and development of the whole organic world in its integral totality, are there to demonstrate ancient wisdom. From the universals down to the particulars, the organic world is discovered to be subject to the same laws of ever-increasing elaboration, of the transition from unity to plurality as the fundamental formula of the evolution of life. Even the growth of nations, of social life, public institutions, the development of the languages, arts, and sciences, all this follows inevitably. And fatally the all-embracing law of the breaking asunder of unity into plurality, and the passage of the homogeneous into multiformity. But while following Indian wisdom, our author exaggerates this fundamental law in his own way, and distorts it. He brings this law to bear even on the historical destinies of mankind. He makes these destinies subservient to, and a proof of, the correctness of the Indian conception. He maintains that humanity as an integral whole, in proportion as it develops and progresses in its evolution, and separates in its parts each becominga distinct and independent branch of the unit drifts more and more away from its original healthy, harmonious unity. The complications of social establishment, social relations, as those of individuality, all lead to the weakening of the vital power, the relaxation of the energy of feeling, and to the destruction of that integral unity, without which no inner harmony is possible. The absence of that harmony generates an inner discord which becomes the cause of the greatest mental misery. Evil has its roots in the very nature of the evolution of life and its complications. Every one of its steps forward is at the same time a step taken toward the dissolution of its energy, and leads to passive apathy. Such is the inevitable result, he says, of every progressive complication of life because evolution or development is a transition from the homogeneous to the heterogeneous, a scattering of the whole into the many, etc., etc. This terrible law is universal and applies to all creation, from the infinitesimally small up to man for, as he says, it is a fundamental law of nature. Now, it is just in this one-sided view of physical nature, which the German author accepts without one single thought as to its spiritual and psychic aspect, that his school is doomed to certain failure. It is not a question whether the said law of differentiation and its fatal consequences may or may not apply, in certain cases, to the growth and development of the animal species, and even of man, but simply, since it is the basis and main support of the whole new theory of the pessimistic school, whether it is really a universal and fundamental law. We want to know whether this basic formula of evolution embraces the whole process of development and growth in its entirety, and whether, indeed, it is within the domain of physical science or not. If it is nothing else than the transition from the homogeneous state to the heterogeneous, as says Mainlander, then it remains to be proved that the given process produces that calm. Plicated combination of tissues and organs which forms and completes the perfect animal and plant. As remarked already by some critics on pessimism and progress, the German pessimist does not doubt it for one moment. His supposed discovery and teaching rest wholly on his certitude that development and the fundamental law of the complicated process of organization represent but one thing, the transformation of unity into plurality. Hence the identification of the process with dissolution and decay, and the weakening of all the forces and energies. Mainlander would be right in his analogies were this law of the differentiation of the homogeneous into the heterogeneous to really represent the fundamental law of the evolution of life. But the idea is quite erroneous metaphysically as well as physically. Evolution does not proceed in a straight line, no more than any other process in nature, but journeys on cyclically, as does all the rest. The cyclic serpents swallow their tails like the serpent of eternity. And it is in this that the Indian formula, which is a secret doctrine teaching, is indeed corroborated by the natural sciences, and especially by biology. 
This is what we read in those scientific letters by an anonymous Russian author and critic, in the evolution of isolated individuals, in the evolution of the organic world, in that of the universe, as in the growth and development of our planet in short wherever any of the processes of progressive complexity take place, there we find, apart from the transition from unity to plurality, and homogeneity to heterogeneity, a converse transformation the transition from plurality to unity, from the heterogeneous to the homogeneous. Minute observation of the given process of progressive complexity has shown, that what takes place in it is not alone the separation of parts, but also their mutual absorption. While one portion of the cells merge into each other and unite into one uniform whole, forming muscular fibers, muscular tissue, others are absorbed in the bone and nerve tissues, etc., etc. The same takes place in the formation of plants. In this case material nature repeats the law that acts in the evolution of the psychic and the spiritual, both descend but to reascend and merge at the starting point. The homogeneous formative mass or element differentiated in its parts, is gradually transformed into the heterogeneous, then, merging those parts into a harmonious whole, it recommences a converse process or revolution and returns as gradually into its primitive or primordial state. Nor does pessimism find any better support in pure materialism, as hitherto the latter has been tinged with a decidedly optimistic bias. Its leading advocates have, indeed, never hesitated to sneer at the theological adoration of the glory of God and all his works. Buchner flings a taunt at Thepentheist who sees in so mad and bad a world the manifestation of the absolute. But, on the whole, the materialists admit a balance of good over evil, perhaps as a buffer against any superstitious tendency to look out and hope for a better one. Narrow as is their outlook, and limited as is their spiritual horizon, they yet see no cause to despair of the drift of things in general. The pantheistic pessimists, however, have never ceased to urge that a despair of conscious being is the only legitimate outcome of atheistic negation. This opinion is, of course, axiomatic, or ought to be so. If in this life only is there hope, the tragedy of life is absolutely without any raison d'etre and a perpetuation of the drama is as foolish as it is futile. The fact that the conclusions of pessimism have been at last assimilated by a certain class of atheistic writers, is a striking feature of the day, and another sign of the times. It illustrates the truism that the void created by modern scientific negation can attend never can be filled by the cold prospects offered as a solatium to optimists. The Kantian enthusiasm of humanity is a poor thing enough with annihilation of the race to ensue as the solar fires die slowly out if, indeed, they do die at all to please physical science at the computed time. If all present sorrow and suffering, the fierce struggle for existence and all its attendant horrors, go for nothing in the long run, if man is a mere ephemeran the sport of blind forces, why assist in the perpetuation of the farce? The ceaseless grind of matter force and law, will but hurry the swarming human millions into eternal oblivion, and ultimately leave no trace or memory of the past, when things return to the nebulosity of the fire mist, whence they emerged. Terrestrial life is no object in itself. It is overcast with gloom and misery. It does not seem strange, then, that the soul-blind negationist should prefer the pessimism of Schopenhauer to the Basilis optimism of Strauss and his followers, which, in the face of their teachings, reminds one of the animal spirits of a young donkey, after a good meal of thistles. One thing is, however, clear, the absolute necessity for some solution, which embraces the facts of existence on an optimistic basis. Modern society is permeated with an increasing cynicism and honeycombed with disgust of life. This is the result of an utter ignorance of the operations of karma and the nature of soul evolution. It is from a mistaken allegiance to thedogmasophomechanical and largely spurious theory of evolution, that pessimism has risen to such undue importance. Once the basis of the great law is grasped and what philosophy can furnish better means for such a grasp and final solution, than the esoteric doctrine of the great 
Indian sages there remains no possible locus standi for the recent amendments to the Skapenhaurian system of thought or the metaphysical subtleties, woven by the philosopher of unconscious. The reasonableness of Kanakiya's existence can be proved only by the study of the primeval now esoteric philosophy. And it says there is neither death nor life, for both are illusions, being, or Venus, is the only reality. This paradox was repeated thousands of ages later by one of the greatest physiologists that ever lived. Life is death, said Claude Bernard. The organism lives because its parts are ever dying. The survival of the fittest is surely based on this truism. The life of the superior whole requires the death of the inferior, the death of the parts depending on and being subservient to it. And, as life is death, so death is life, and the whole great cycle of lives form but one existence the worst day of which is on our planet. He who knows will make the best of it. For there is a dawn for every being, when once freed from illusion and ignorance by knowledge, and he will at last proclaim in truth and all consciousness to Mahamaya, broken thy house is, and the rich pole split. Delusion fashioned it. Safe pass I thence deliverance to obtain. Nine out of every hundred people one meets would, if asked, reply in such a fashion as to make it plain that they had confounded religion with theology. Asterisk 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 but perhaps we have to look for true Christianity and true civilization and culture in the modern higher courts of law. Alas, there are modern judges of whom their lord, our karma, would say, hear what the unjust judge saith. For, in our day, the decree of justice is sometimes uttered in the voice of the bigots who sit in Solomon's seat and judge as the inquisitors of old did. In our century of Christian civilization, judges emulating their predecessors of the tribunal of the sons of Loyola, employ the more exquisite instruments of moral torture, to insult and goad to desperation a helpless plaintiff or defendant. In this they are aided by advocates, often type of the ancient headsmen, who, metaphorically, break the bones of the wretch seeking justice, or worse yet, defile his good name and stab him to the heart with the vilest innuendos, false suppositions concocted for the occasion but which the victim knows will hence. Fourth become actual truths in the mouth of foul gossip and slander. Between the defunct brutal tortures of the unchristian inquisition of old, and the more refined mental tortures of its as unchristian but more civilized copy are court and truculent cross-examiners, the palm of gentleness and charity might almost be given to the former. Thus we find every ideal of old, moral, and spiritual, a base to correspond with the present low moral and unspiritual conceptions of the public. Brutalized by a psychical famine which has lasted through generations, they are ready to give every ideal spiritual regenerator as food for the dogs, while like their debauched proto-types, the Roman populace under Nero, Caligula, and Heliogabalus, they crowd to see bullfights in Paris, where the wretched horses drag their bleeding bowels around the arena, imported Almers dancing their loathsome danse du ventre, black and white pugilists bruising each of others' features into bloody pulp, and raise a theoric with their cheers when the Samsons and Sandos burst chains and snap wires by expanding their preternatural muscles. Why keep up the old farce any longer? Why not change the Christmas carol thus, Gladiator Natus Hodi? Or change the well-known anthem after this fashion? On the earth where they incarnate in humanity. Thus satanic humanity becomes comprehensible. After moving around his cycle of obstacles he may, with accumulated experiences, after all the throes of humanity, emerge again into the light as Eastern philosophy teaches. If Hugo had lived to complete his poem, possibly with strengthened insight, he would have blended his satanic concept with that of the Aryan races which makes all minor powers, good or evil, born at the beginning and dying at the close of each divine age as human nature is ever the same, and sociological, spiritual and intellectual evolution is a question of step by step, it is quite possible that instead of catching one half of the satanic ideal as Hugo did, the next great poet may get it wholly, thus voicing for his generation the eternal idea of cosmic equilibrium so nobly emphasized in the Aryan mythology.
The first half of that ideal approaches sufficiently to the human ideal to make the moral tortures of Hugo Satan entirely comprehensible to the Eastern Theosophist. What is the chief torment of this great cosmic anarchist? It is the moral agony caused by such a duality of nature the tearing asunder of the spirit of evil and opposition from the undying element of primeval love in the Archangel. That spark of divine love for light and harmony, that no hate can wholly smother, causes him a torture far more unbearable than his fall and exile for protest and rebellion. This bright, heavenly spark, shining from Satan in the black darkness of his kingdom of moral night, makes him visible to the intuitive reader. It made Victor Hugo see him sobbing in superhuman despair, each mighty sob shaking the earth from pole to pole, sobs first of baffled rage that he cannot extirpate love for divine goodness, God, from his nature, then changing into a wail of despair at being cut off from that divine love he so much yearns for. All this is intensely human. This abyss of despair is Satan's salvation. In his fall, a feather drops from his white and once immaculate wing, is lighted up by a ray of divine radiance and forthwith transformed into a bright being, the angel Liberty. Thus, she is Satan's daughter, the child jointly of God and the fallen archangel, the progeny of good and evil, of light and darkness, and God acknowledges this common and sublime paternity that unites them. It is Satan's daughter who saves him. At the acme of despair at feeling himself hated by light, Satan hears the divine words No, I hate thee not. Seth the voice, an angel is between us, and her deeds go to thy credit. Man, bound by thee, by her is now delivered. O Satan, tu per dire o present, J. E. V. Vre. Veens, I ange liberty se ta fi e t la men set pater night sublime noose unit. The whole conception is an efflorescence of metaphysical ideality. This white lotus of thought springs now, as in former ages, from the rottenness of the world of matter, generating protest and liberty. It is springing in our very midst and under our very eyes, from the mire of modern civilization, fecund bed of contrasting virtues. In this foul soil sprouted the germs which ultimately developed into all denying protestators, atheists, nihilists, and anarchists, men of the terror. Bad, violent, criminal some of them may be, yet no one of them could stand as the copy of Satan, but taking this heartbroken, hopeless, embittered portion of humanity in their collectivity, they are just Satan himself, for he is the ideal synthesis of all discordant forces and each separate human vice or passion is but an atom of his totality. In the very depths of the heart of this human satanic totality burns the divine spark, all negations notwithstanding. It is called love for humanity, an ardent aspiration for a universal reign of justice hence a latent desire for light, harmony, and goodness. Where do we find such a divine spark among the proud and the wealthy? In respectable society and the correct orthodox, so-called religious portion of the public, one finds but a predominating feeling of selfishness and a desire for wealth at the expense of the weak and the destitute, hence as a parallel, indifference to injustice and evil. Before Satan, the incarnate protest, repents and reunites with his fellow men in one common brotherhood, all cause for protest must have disappeared from earth. And that can come to pass only when greed, bias, and prejudice shall have disappeared before the elements of altruism and justice to all. Freedom, or liberty, is but a vain word just now all over the civilized globe, freedom is but a cunning synonym for oppression of the people in the name of the people, and it exists for castes, never for units. To bring about the reign of freedom as contemplated by Hugo Satan, the angel liberty has to be born simultaneously and by common love and consent of the higher wealthy caste, and the lower classes THS purge in other words, to become the progeny of God and Satan, thereby reconciling the two. But this is a utopia for the present. It cannot take place before the castes of the modern Levites and their theology the Dead Sea fruit of spirituality shall have disappeared, and the priests of the future have declared before the whole world in the words of their god etj efface la nude sinister, et reen en en rest. Satan est mort, ren is olosopher celeste.
Lucifer, May, 1891 Civilization, The Death of Art and Beauty I in an interview with celebrated Hungarian violinist, M. Remini I, the Paul Mall Gazette reporter makes the artist narrate some very interesting experiences in the Far East. I was the first European artist who ever played before the Mikado of Japan, he said, and reverting to that which has ever been a matter of deep regret for every lover of the artistic and the picturesque the violinist added, on August 8, 1886, I appeared before His Majesty a day. Memorable, unfortunately, for the change of costume commanded by the Empress. She herself, abandoning the exquisite beauty of the feminine Japanese costume, appeared on that day for the first time and at my concert in European costume, and it made my heart ache to see her. I could have greeted her had I dared with a long wail of despair upon my traveled violin. Six ladies accompanied her, they themselves being clad in their native costume, and walking with infinite grace and charm. Alas, alas, but this is not all. The Mikado this hitherto sacred, mysterious, invisible, and unreachable personage, the Mikado himself was in the uniform of a European general. At that time the court etiquette was so strict, my accompanist was not permitted into His Majesty's drawing room, and this was told me beforehand. I had a good replacement, as my ambassador, Count Zaluski, who had been a pupil of Liszt, was able himself to accompany me. You will be astonished when I tell you that, having chosen for the first piece in the program my transcription for the violin, of a C-sharp minor polonaise by Chopin, a musical piece of the most intrinsic value and poetic depths, the emperor, when I had finished, intimated to count. Ito, his first minister, that I should play it again. The Japanese taste is good. I was laden with presents of untold value, one item only being a gold lacquer box of the 17th century. I played in Hong Kong and outside Canton, no European being allowed to live inside. There I made an interesting excursion to the Portuguese possession of Macau, visiting the cave where Camo Enz wrote his Lugid. It was very interesting to see outside the Chinese town of Macau a European Portuguese town which to this very day has remained unchanged since the 16th century. In the midst of the exquisite tropical vegetation of Java, and despite the terrific heat, I gave 62 concerts. In 67 days, traveling all over the island, inspecting its antiquities, the chief of which is a most wonderful Buddhist temple, the Buro Budur, or many Buddhas. This building contains six miles of figures, and is a solid pile of stone, larger than the pyramids. They have, these Javans, an extraordinarily sweet orchestra in the national same lang, which consists of percussion instruments played by 18 people, but to hear this orchestra, with its most weird oriental chorus and ecstatic dances, one must have had the privilege of being invited by the Sultan of Solo, sole emperor of the world. I have seen and heard nothing more dreamy and poetic than the Serampis danced by nine royal princesses. Where are the esthetes of a few years ago? Or was this little confederation of the lovers of art but own of the soap bubbles of our fin de siècle, rich in promise and suggestion of many a possibility, but dead in works and act? Or, if there are any true lovers of art yet left among them, why do they not organize and send out missionaries the world over, to tell picturesque Japan and other countries ready to fall victims that, to imitate the will o' the wisp of European culture and fascination, means for a non-Christian land, the committing of suicide, that it means sacrifice and gone individual. ITY for an empty show and shadow, at best it is to exchange the original and the picturesque for the vulgar and the hideous. Truly and indeed it is high time that at last something should be done in this direction, and before the deceitful civilization of the conceited nations of but yesterday has irretrievably hypnotized the older races, and made them succumb to its upas tree wiles and supposed superiority. Otherwise, old arts and artistic creations, everything original and unique will very soon disappear. Already national dresses and time Hanuud customs and everything beautiful, artistic, and worth preservation is fast disappearing from view. At no distant day, alas, 
the best relics of the past will perhaps be found only in museums in sorry, solitary, and be ticketed samples preserved under glass. Such is the work and the unavoidable result of our modern civilization. Skin deep in reality in its visible effects, in the blessings it is alleged to have given to the world, its roots are rotten to the core. It is to its progress that selfishness and materialism, the greatest curses of the nations, are due, and the latter will most surely lead to the annihilation of art and of the appreciation of the truly harmonious and beautiful. Hitherto, materialism has only led to a universal tendency to unification on the material plane and a corresponding diversity on that of thought and spirit. It is this universal tendency, which by propelling humanity, through its ambition and selfish greed, to an incessant chase after wealth and the obtaining at any price of the supposed blessings of this life, causes it to aspire or rather gravitate to one level, the lowest of all the plane of empty appearance. Materialism and indifference to all save the selfish realization of wealth and power, and the overfeeding of national and personal vanity, have gradually led nations and men to the almost entire oblivion of spiritual ideals, of the love of nature, to the correct appreciation of things. Like a hideous leprosy our Western civilization has eaten its way through all the quarters of the globe and hardened the human heart. Soul-saving is its deceitful, lying pretext, greed for additional revenue through opium, rum, and the inoculation of European vices the real aim. In the Far East it has infected with the spirit of imitation the higher classes of the pagan save China, whose national conservatism deserves our respect, and in Europe it has engrafted fashion save the mark. Even on the dirty, starving proletariat itself. For the last thirty years, as if some deceitful semblance of a reversion to the ancestral type awarded to men by the Darwinian theory in its moral added to its physical characteristics were contemplated by an evil spirit tempting mankind, almost every race and nation under the sun in Asia has gone mad in its passion for aping Europe. This, added to the frantic endeavor to destroy nature in every direction, and also every vestige of older civilizations far superior to our own in arts, godliness, and the appreciation of the grandiose and harmonious must result in such national calamities. Therefore, do we find hitherto artistic and picturesque Japan succumbing wholly to the temptation of justifying the ape theory by simianizing its populations in order to bring the country on a level with canting, greedy and artificial Europe? For certainly Europe is all this. It is canting and deceitful from its diplomats down to its custodians of religion, from its political down to its social laws, selfish, greedy and brutal beyond expression in its grabbing characteristics. And yet there are those who wonder at the gradual decadence of true art, as if art could exist without imagination, fancy, and a just appreciation of the beautiful in nature, or without poetry and high religious, hence, metaphysical aspirations. The galleries of paintings and sculpture, we hear, be come every year poorer in quality, if richer in quantity. It is lamented that while there is a plethora of ordinary productions, the greatest scarcity of remarkable pictures and statuary prevails. Is this not most evidently due to the facts that, a, the artists will very soon remain with no better models than nature mort, or still life, to inspire themselves with jand, a, that the chief concern is not the creation of artistic objects, but their speedy sale and profits, under such conditions, the fall of true art is only a natural consequence. Owing to the triumphant march and the invasion of civilization, nature, as well as man and ethics, is sacrificed, and is fast becoming artificial. Climates are changing, and the face of the whole world will soon be altered. Under the murderous hand of the pioneers of civilization, the destruction of whole primeval forests is leading to the drying up of rivers, and the opening of the canal of Suez has changed the climate of Egypt as that of Panama will divert the course of the Gulf Stream. Almost tropical countries are now becoming cold and rainy, and fertile lands threaten to be soon transformed into sandy deserts. A few years more and there will not remain within a radius of 50 miles around our large cities one single rural spot inviolate from vulgar speculation. In scenery, 
the picturesque and the natural is daily replaced by the grotesque and the artificial. Scarce a landscape in England but the fair body of nature is desecrated by the advertisements of Pears Soap and Beecham's Pills. The pure air of the country is polluted with smoke, the smells of greasy railway engines, and the sickening odors of gin, whiskey, and beer. And once that every natural spot in the surrounding scenery is gone, and the eye of the painter finds but the artificial and hideous products of modern speculation to rest upon, artistic taste will have to follow suit and disappear along with them. No man ever did or ever will work well, but either from actual sight or sight of faith, says Ruskin, speaking of art. Thus, the first quarter of the coming century may witness painters of landscapes, who have never seen an acre of land free from human improvement, and painters of figures whose ideas of female beauty of form will be based on the wasp-like pinched-in waists of corseted, hollow-chested and consumptive society bells it is not from such models that a picture deserving of the definition of Horace a poem without words is produced. Artificially draped Parisians and London cockneys sitting for Italian contadini or Arab bed. Winds can never replace the genuine article, and both free Bedouins and genuine Italian peasant girls are, thanks to civilization, fast becoming things of the past. Where shall artists find genuine models in the coming century, when the hosts of the free nomads of the desert, and perchance all the Negro tribes of Africa or what? will remain of them after their decimation by Christian canons, and the rum and opium of the Christian civilizer will have donned European coats and top hats? And that this is precisely what awaits art under the beneficial progress of modern civilization, is self-evident to all. I. Let us boast of the blessings of civilization, by all means. Let us brag of our sciences and the grand discoveries of the age, its achievements in mechanical arts, its railroads, telephones and electric batteries, but let us not forget, meanwhile, to purchase at fabulous prices, almost as great as those given in our day for a prize dog. Or an old prima donna's song, the paintings and statuary of uncivilized, barbarous antiquity and of the Middle Ages, for such objects of art will be reproduced no more. Civilization has told their eleventh hour. It has rung the death knell of the old arts, and the last decade of our century is summoning the world to the funeral of all that was grand, genuine, and original in the old civilizations. Would Raphael, oh yeah lovers of art, have created one single of his many Madonnas, had he had, instead of Fornarina and the once Juno-like women of the Trastevere of Rome to inspire his genius, only the present-day models, or the niched virgins of the nooks and corners of modern Italy, in crinolines and high-heeled boots? Or, would Andrea del Sarto have produced his famous Venus and Cupid from a modern East End working girl one of the latest victims to fashion holding under the shadow of a gigantic hat a la air, feathered like the scalp of an Indian chief, a dirty, scrofulous brat from the slums? How could Titan have ever I'm mortalized his golden-haired patrician ladies of Venice had he been compelled to move all his life in the society of our actual professional beauties? with their straw-colored, dyed capillaries that transform human hair into the fur of a yellow angora cat? May not one venture to state with the utmost confidence that the world would never have had the Athena Limnia of Phidias that ideal of beauty in face and form had Aspasia, the Milesian, or the fair daughters of Hellas, whether in the days of Pericles or in any other, disfigured that form with stays and bustle, and coated that face with white enamel, after the fashion of the varnished features of the mummies of the dead Egyptians. We see the same in architecture. Not even the genius of Michelangelo himself could have failed to receive its death blow at the first sight of the Eiffel Tower, or the Albert Hall, or more horrible. Still, the Albert Memorial nor, for the matter of that, could it have received any suggestive idea from the Colosseum and the Palace of the Caesars, in their present whitewashed and repaired state. Whither, then, shall we, in our days of civilization, go to find the natural, or even simply the picturesque? Is it still to Italy, to Swit, Zerland or Spain? But the Bay of Naples even if its waters be as blue and transparent as on the day when the people of Cumi selected its shores for a colony, 
and its surrounding scenery as gloriously beautiful as ever thanks to that spirit of mimicry which has infected sea and land, has now lost its most artistic and most original features. It is bereft of its lazy, dirty, but intensely picturesque figures of old, of its Lazzaroni and Harcarolos, its fishermen and country girls. Instead of the former's red or blue Phrygian cap, and the latter's statuesque, half-nude figure and poetical rags, we see nowadays but the caricatured specimens of modern civilization and fashion. The gay tarantella resounds no longer on the cool sands of the moonlit shore, it is replaced by that libel on Terpsy chore, the modern quadrille, in the gaslit, gin-smelling sailor's trotorias. Filth still pervades the land, as of yore, but it is made the more apparent on the threadbare city coat, the mangled chimney pot hat and the once fashionable, now cast away European bonnet. Picked up in the hotel gutters, they now grace the unkempt heads of the once picturesque Neapolitans. The type of the latter has died out, and there is nothing to distinguish the Lazzaroni from the Venetian gondolier, the Calabrian brigand, or the London street sweeper and beggar. The still, sunlit waters of Canal Grande bear no longer their gondolas, filled on festival days with gaily dressed Venetians, with picturesque boatmen and girls. The black gondola that glides silently under the heavy carved balconies of the old patrician palazzi, reminds one now more of a black floating coffin, with a soul. M looking, dark clothed undertaker paddling it on towards the sticks, than of the gondola of thirty years ago. Venice looks more gloomy now than during the days of Austrian slavery from which it was rescued by Napoleon III. Once on shore, its gondolier is scarcely distinguishable from his fare, the British MP on his holiday tour in the old city of the Doges. Such is the leveling hand of all destroying civilization. It is the same all over Europe. Look at Switzerland. Hardly a decade ago, every canton had its distinguishing national costume, as clean and fresh as it was peculiar. Now the people are ashamed to wear it. They want to be mistaken for foreign guests, to be regarded as a civilized nation which follows who I tevin in fashion. Cross over to Spain. Of all the relics of old, the smell of rancid oil and garlic is alone left to remind one of the poetry of the old days in the country of the CID. The graceful mantilla has almost disappeared, the proud Hidalgo beggar has taken himself off from the street corner, the nightly serenades of lovesick Romeos are gone out of fashion, and the duenna contemplates going in for woman's rights. The members of the social purity associations may say thank God to this and lay the change at the door of Christian and moral reforms of civilization. But has morality gained anything in Spain with the disappearance of the nocturnal lovers and duennas? We have every right to say, no. A don one outside a house is less dangerous than one inside. Social immorality is as rife as ever if not more so, in Spain, and it must be so, indeed when even Harper's guide book quotes in its last edition as follows, morals in all classes, especially in the higher, are in the most degraded state. Veils, indeed, are thrown aside, and serenades are rare, but gallantry and intrigue are as active as ever. The men think little of their married obligations, the women are willing victims of unprincipled gallantry. Spain, Madrid, page 678 in this, Spain is but on a par with all other countries civilized or now civilizing, and is assuredly not worse than many another country that could be named, but that which may be said of it with truth is, that what it has lost in poetry through civilization, it has gained in hypocrisy and loose morals. The cortejo has turned into the petit creve, the castanets have become silent. Because, perhaps, the noise of the uncorked champagne bottles affords more excitement to the rapidly civilizing nation, and the Andalauso tint Bruni having taken to cosmetics. And face enamel, La Marquesa di Almedi may be said to have been buried with a Fred de Musset. The gods have indeed been propitious to the Alhambra. They have permitted it to be burnt before its chaste moresque beauty had been finally desecrated, as are the rock cut temples of India, the pyramids, and other relics by drunken orgies. This superb relic of the Moors had already suffered, once before,
by Christian improvement. It is a tradition still told in Granada, and history too, that the monks of Ferdinand and Isabella had made of Alhambra that palace of petrified flowers dyed with the hues of the wings of angels a filthy prison for thieves and murderers. Modern speculators might have done worse, they might have polluted its walls and pearl inlaid ceilings, the lovely gilding and stucco, the fairy-like arabesques, and the marble and gossamer-like carvings, with commercial advertisements, after the inquisitors had already once before covered the building with whitewash and permitted the prison keepers to use Alhambra Hall's fort air donkeys and cattle. Doubting but little that the fury of the Majorlinus for imitating the French and English must have already, at this stage of modern civilization, infected every province of Spain, we may regard that lovely country as dead. A friend speaks, as an eyewitness, of cocktails spilled near the marble fountain of the Alhambra, over the blood marks left by the hapless Abonsarages slain by Boabdil, and of a Parisian cancan per sang performed by working girls and soldiers of Granada, in the court of Lyons. But these are only trifling signs of the time and the spread of cull. Tour page the middle and the lower classes. Wherever the spirit of aping possesses the heart of the nation the poor working classes there the elements of nationality disappear and the country is on the eve of losing its individuality and all things change for the worse. What is the use of talking so loudly of the benefits of Christian civilization, of its having softened public morals, refined national customs and manners, etc., etc., when our modern civilization has achieved quite the reverse? Civilization has depended for ages, says Burke, upon two principles. The spirit of a gentleman and the spirit of religion. And how many true gentlemen have we left, when compared even with the days of half-barbarous knighthood? Religion has become canting hypocrisy and the genuine religious spirit is regarded nowadays as insanity. Civilization, it is averred, has destroyed brigandage, established public security elevated morality and built railways which now honeycomb the face of the globe. Indeed. Let us analyze seriously and impartially all these benefits and we shall soon find that civilization has done nothing of the kind. At best it has put a false nose on every evil of the past, adding hypocrisy and false pretense to the natural ugliness of each. If it is true to say that it has put down in some civilized sin. Tours of Europe near Rome, in the Bois de Boulogne or on Hampstead Heath banditti and highwaymen, it is also as true that it has, thereby, destroyed Rob Ryanly as a specialty, the latter having now become a common occupation in every city great or small. The robber and cutthroat has only exchanged his dress and appearance by donning the livery of civilization the ugly modern attire. Instead of being robbed under the vault of thick woods and the protection of darkness, people are robbed nowadays under the electric light of saloons and the protection of trade laws and police. Regulations As to open daylight brigandage, the mafia of New Orleans and the Mela Vita of Sicily, with high officialdom, population, police, and jury forced to play into the hands of regularly organized bands of murderers, thieves, and tyrants one in the full glare of European culture, show how Ferrer civilization has succeeded. In establishing public security, or Christian religion in softening the hearts of men and the ways and customs of a barbarous past. Modern cyclopedias are very fond of expatiating upon the decadence of Rome and its pagan horrors. But if the latest editions of the Dictionary of Greek and Roman Biography were honest enough to make a parallel between those monsters of depravity of ancient civilization, Messalina and Faustina, Nero and Commodus, and modern European aristocracy, it might be found that the latter could give odds to the former in social hypocrisy, at any rate. Between the shameless and beastly debauchery of an emperor Commodus, and as beastly a depravity of more than one honorable, high official representative of the people, the only difference to be found is that while Commodus was a member of all the sacerdotal colleges of paganism, the modern debauchee may be a high MEM. Burr of the Evangelical Christian Church is a distinguished and pious pupil of Moody and Sankey and what not. It is not the Colches of Homer, who was the type of the Colches in the opera et la belle Helene, but the modern sacerdotal Pecksniff and his followers. As to the blessings of railways and the annihilation of space and time, 
it is still an undecided question without speaking of the misery and starvation the introduction of steam engines and machinery in general has brought for years on those who depend on their manual labor whether railways do not kill more people. In one month than the brigands of all Europe used to murder in one read the cutthroats paradise in the Edinburgh Review for April, 1877. And the digest of it in the Pall Mall Gazette of April 15, 1891, murder as a profession. A whole year. The victims of railroads, moreover, are killed under circumstances which surpass in horror anything the cutthroats may have devised. One reads almost daily of railway disasters in which people are burned to death in the blazing wreckage, mangled and crushed out of recognition and killed by dozens and scores. 2-3 This is a trifle worse than the highwaymen of old Newgate. Nor has crime been abetted at all by the spread of civilization, though owing to the progress of science in chemistry and physics, it has become more secure from detection and more ghastly in its realization than it ever has been. Speak of Christian civilization having improved public morals, of Christianity being the only religion which has established and recognized universal brotherhood. Look at the brotherly feeling shown by American Christians to the Red Indian and the Negro Huzek, 7 slash Zen, slash slash pies the farce of the age. Witness the love of the Anglo Indians for the mild Hindu, the Musulman, and the Buddhist. See how these Christians love each other in their incessant law litigations, their libels against each other, the mutual hatred of the churches and of the sects. Modern civilization and Christianity are oil and water they will never mix. Nations among which the most horrible crimes are daily perpetrated, nations which rejoice in Tromans and Jack the Rippers, in fiends like MRS. Reeves the traitor in baby slaughter to the number of 300 victims as is believed for the sake of filthy lucre, nations which not only permit but encourage a Monaco with its hosts of suicides, that patronize prize fights, bullfights. Useless and cruel sport and even indiscriminate vivisection such nations have no right to boast of their civilization. Nations furthermore which from political considerations, dare not put down slave trade once for all, and out of revenue greed, hesitate to abolish opium and whiskey trades, fattening on the untold misery and degradation of millions of human beings, have no right to call themselves either Christian or civilized. A civilization finally that leads only to the destruction of every noble, artistic feeling in man, can only deserve a the epithet to to take one instance. A Reuters telegram from America, where such accidents are almost of daily occurrence, gives the following details of a wrecked train, one of the cars which was attached to a gravel train and which contained five Italian workmen, was thrown forward into the center of the wreck and the whole mass caught fire. Two of the men were keelied outright and the remaining three were injured, pinioned in the wreckage. As the flames reached them their cries and groans were heartrending. Owing to the position of the car and the intense heat the rescuers were unable to reach them, and were compelled to watch them slowly burn to death. It is understood that all the victims leave families. A barbarous. We, the modern-day Europeans, are Vendels as great, if not greater than Attila with his savage hordes. Consummatum est. Such is the work of our modern Christian civilization and its direct effects. The destroyer of art, the Shylock, who, for every mite of gold it gives, demands and receives in return a pound of human flesh, in the heart blood, in the physical and mental suffering of the masses, in the loss of everything true and lovable can hardly pretend to deserve grateful or respectful wreck. Onition. The unconsciously prophetic fin de siècle, in short, is the long ego foreseen slash, slash, de cycle, when according to Manjunatha Sutra, justice will have died, leaving as its successor blind law, and as its guru and guide selfishness, when wicked things and deeds will have to be regarded as meritorious, and holy actions as madness. Beliefs are dying out, divine life is mocked at, art and genius, truth and justice are daily sacrificed to the insatiable mammon of the age money grubbing. The artificial replaces everywhere the real, the false substitutes the true. Not a sunny valley, not a shadowy grove left immaculate on the bosom of mother nature. And yet what marble fountain in fashionable square or city park, 
What bronze lions or tumble-down dolphins with upturned tails can compare with an old worm-eaten, moss-covered, weather-stained country well, or a rural windmill in a green meadow? What Arc de Triumph can ever compare with the low arch of Grottoisa, at Capri, and what? City Park or Champs-Élysées, rival Sorrento, the wild garden of the world, the birthplace of Tasso? Ancient civilizations have never sacrificed nature to speculation, but holding it as divine, have honored her natural beauties by the erection of works of art, such as our modern electric civilization could never produce even in dream. The sublime grandeur, the mournful gloom and majesty of the ruined temples of Pistum, that stand for ages like so many centuries over the sepulchre of the past and the forlorn hope of the future amid the mountain wilderness of Sorrento, have inspired more men of genius than the new civilization will ever produce. Give us the banditti who once infested these ruins. Rather than thrill roads that cut through the old Etruscan tombs, the first may take the purse and life of the few, the second are undermining the lives of the millions by poisoning with foul gases the sweet breath of the pure air. In ten years, by century XXTH. Southern France with its nice and con, and even Engadine, may hope to rival the London atmosphere with its fogs, thanks to the increase of population and changes of climate. We hear that speculation is preparing a new iniquity against nature, smoky, greasy, stench-breathing funiculaires, baby railways, are being contemplated for some world-renowned mountains. They are preparing to creep like so many loathsome, fire-vomiting reptiles over the immaculate body of the Jungfrau, and a railway tunnel is to pierce the heart of the snow-capped veer. Jin Mountain, the glory of Europe. And why not? Has not national speculation pulled down the priceless remains of the Grand Temple of Neptune at Rome, to build over its colossal corpse on sculptured pillars the present custom house? Are we so wrong then, in maintaining that modern civilization W with its spirit of speculation is the very genius of destruction, and as such, what better words can be addressed to it than this definition of Burke, a spirit of innovation is generally the result of a selfish temper and confined views. People will not look forward to posterity, who never look backward to their ancestors. H.P.B. Theosophical Literature ISIS Unveiled, A Master Key to the Mysteries of Ancient and Modern Science and Theology by H.P. Blavatsky Vol. 1 Science, XLV plus 628 pages. Vol. 2 Theology, 4 plus 640 pp. This exhaustive study of religion and science was Madame Blavatsky's first presentation of theosophy to the modern world. It is reproduced in photographic facsimile of the original edition, 187 two volumes bound in one, cloth, complete with general index and supplementary topical index. American edition The Secret Doctrine, the Synthesis of Science, Religion, and Philosophy by H. P. Blavatsky Vol. 1 Cosmosynesis, Slady I plus 676 pages. Vol. U. Anthropogenesis, 14 plus 798 pages. A System slash C. Development of Theosophical Teachings on Cosmogenesis, Anthropogenesis, Symbolism, Comparative Religion, with Extensive Comparisons of Ancient Wisdom with Scientific Conceptions. Facsimile of Original, 1888, Edition, Two Volumes Bound in One, Cloth, Complete with Index, Triple XPP. American Edition Index to the Secret Doctrine, All Volume and Page Reference to the Original Edition, London 1888, and to the Photographic Facsimile Reproduction, Listed Above, Reprint XF 172 Pages. American edition The Key to Theosophy, an exposition, in question, and answer, of the ethics, science, and philosophy of theosophy by H. P. Blavatsky reprint of original edition, 1889, 15 plus 367 pages. Indian edition The Voice of the Silence, by H. P. Blavatsky a blank verse rendition of chosen fragments from the Book of the Golden Precepts, belonging to the contemplative or Mahayana, Yogacarya, School. Reprint of the original edition, 1889, 4 plus 79 pages, cloth. 
Indian Edition Transactions of the Blavatsky Lodge, by H. P. Blavatsky Reprint of the Original, 1923, XXIV plus 149 pages, cloth. American Edition A Modern Panarayan, by H. P. Blavatsky A Collection of Fugitive Fragments. American Edition The Ocean of Theosophy by William Q. Judge A Comprehensive Text on the Theosophical Philosophy by a Co-Founder of the Theosophical Movement Widely Used as a Text in Study Classes Reprint of Original Edition, 1893, 15 plus 182 pages Indian Edition. The Bhagavad G1 rendered into English by William Q. Judge An Ancient Dialogue of Philosophical Religion from the Hindu Epic, the Mahabharata, Cloth, 18 plus 133 pages. Indian edition notes on the Bhagavad Gita by W.Q. Judge Indian edition letters that have helped me by W.Q. Judge American edition, and shorter Indian edition.